Hello, this is the hardcore legend Mick Foley, and if you are interested in listening to idiots, you came to the right place. Have a nice day. I'm gonna die surrounded by the biggest idiots in the galaxy. You're a slacker. You stupid idiot! Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Oh, idiot! Game over, man! Hey, hey, careful Whoa. with that, Ronnie Millsap. We're downrange. What's the matter with you? I feel like a Kentucky Fried Idiot. Oh, I'll take it from here, nurse. We're putting the band back together. We get it. No way. We're on a mission from God. Gentlemen, Ciccolini here may talk like an idiot and look like an idiot, but don't let that fool you. He really is an idiot. I was going to spend the night assembling the boys you, but this is holding my interest. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, friends and fiends, and welcome to Free Range Idiocy, the podcast about everything, but mostly just the stuff we like. This is episode 25, and we're heading back to the Mesa for more of Westworld Season 3. That's right, it's episodes 5 and 6 in a whole new Westworld Part 3. My name is Todd, and with me as always is a man who once lived in the back corner booth of a Denny's in southern Idaho for six months before anyone noticed. He is the Ricky Morton to my Robert Gibson. We're always baby faces because it's our damn show. I give you the man they call Tim. Greetings, my brother. How are you? You know, I'm, I'm doing all right. Now, we're going to play Name the Tag Team. Can you give me the tag team, sir? That is the Rock and Roll Express, baby. I, I kind of figured that one was pretty <laughs> easy, but... <laughs> Especially for someone of your stature in the wrestling world. Uh, and may I just say, uh, I, I don't know if I, I would need to look it up on the interwebs, but they were actually, uh, as as at some point last year, tag team champions in some independent division. <laughs> so oh, they totally. Are, they are still rocking and rolling. Oh, yeah. I saw I saw a the photo when I was looking them up was from 2018. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. Those, those gents yeah. are... Let's just say uh, are not aging gracefully. Uh, well, but still out there doing it. So hey, I'll give them props for that. They are. They are. And uh, well, uh, thank you all for for tuning in, and we appreciate you tuning into this here podcast on the interwebs. It is mm-hmm. so great to get a chance to do this, and to well, it's 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 week seven of lockdown. You know, we 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 have uh, actually we we should take a moment pause and recognize uh we have hit the quarter century mark my friend this is episode 25 as you said i know which uh, honestly i'm just amazed that you haven't fired me yet i've i'm continually surprised every single episode when i'm like hey are we recording this week you're like yep well (laughs) when 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 we had mike on uh during the rush episode we, we were working out some contractual things there so you know (laughs) <laughs> well, that's what I, I'm just wondering why it's taking so long. I mean, is <laughs> is he touring the subcontinent right now or something? I don't, well, I don't know. He, well, he, I think he mentioned something about jumping on a, a whale ship at some point, so oh, maybe. Oh, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, we uh, we thank all the listeners for tuning in, and uh, we appreciate you all there in internet interwebs land. And uh, we, you can definitely uh, find us on social medias. We love the social medias. Facebook, Twitter, mm-hmm. and Instagram, those are all at Free Range Idiocy. We're also on the YouTubes. We're going to be big on the YouTubes, sir. We're going to be huge, mm. huge on the YouTubes. Huge. Uh, of course, we don't have our own custom URL, so you have to search Free Range Idiocy <coughs> and find us there. Be sure to subscribe, and then we can get one of them cool URLs, and then we'll be able mm. to do like YouTube.com slash Free Range Idiocy, which... Some sort of status symbol of of some kind, I guess. This is really just a vanity project to just, you know, find as many ways we can, you know, hook ourselves up with names out on the Internet. Exactly. uh, I I want the record. And and next week, next week, we're going to be on MySpace. That's right. Taking over the world, baby. I'm going to see see if Friendster is still active. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Probably in the Denny's in Idaho. (laughs) More like Arkansas, I'm betting. (laughs) And that's that's uh, no crack on Arkansas, but it's still 1983 there. So I just well, I I feel okay saying that. Yeah. Uh, so another thing that we have going on right now, uh, you can actually send us questions. We are accepting questions and suggestions from the public at large. Good Lord, help us! I'm not really yeah. sure how this is going to go. The, the these are these are not just questions, but 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 also well, when you said suggestions, topic suggestions, you know, are. are we, we're a podcast that is a bit, uh, as we say, ranging free. Uh, we are so, for the people. We are for the people. And we give it back to you. 
the people. We, yeah, d- dare dare I say at some point we uh, we we could we could steal one from the Rock and call ourselves the People Show, but but I but he might come after me for that. Oh, well, I'm so. sure he's got that trademarked. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or Vince has got it. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, we, we would like to hear, uh, you know, if there's some ideas out there, you have a sense of the sort of things we're, we're dabbling in in topics, the, if you have some other ideas. We, we did receive our first one this week, uh, Ooh, so uh, nice. we will have an executive meeting this week, uh, which again <laughs> means uh, texting at <laughs> different parts of the day. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm on the can. I got a couple of minutes. <laughs> Wait, look at this. I know that half the time when oh, you send me send Lord. me text, you're you're popping a squat. I know that. Oh, I know stop it. it! You're a busy Lord. man. I know it's the only time you have free. Oh, stop it! <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, folks, oh. it's going to be one of them shows. He, he, he went there. Good God. The people. So, anyways, you can send oh. all of your suggestions and thoughts and concerns and outright bribery to yeah. Tim at freerangeidiocy.com. That's Tim at freerangeidiocy.com. Mm. No shipping, no handling. No. No response, probably. Uh, but, anyways, you, so you can also subscribe to our podcast, our humble little place here on the interwebs. We're on Podbean, we're on Spotify, we're on iTunes, and we actually post our full episodes on YouTube as well. If that happens to be your channel of choice, we like to give you options is what it's mm-hmm. all about, folks. Options, that's what we're all about. Now, uh, I think there was one other thing that we have to get to here before we get to our, our beverage, which, good Lord, it just looks fine sitting there, but we have to, we have to talk about a man, nay, a myth, who mm-hmm. had, who has shuffled off the mortal coil and mm. has left this earth for that great wrestling ring in the sky. Yes. We are speaking, of course, Howard Finkel. Yes. The Fink. The Fink. And, and maybe ha- you can, can you educate people on who, who Howard Finkel is? Well, if, if you were a wrestling fan in the 1980s, you saw ha- Howard Finkel at some point. There, there is no way you could not have, have seen him or heard him. Um, he was a, a legendary announcer. I, as I was reading about him, um, so he, he passed away. I believe it was two weeks ago. I think it was uh, uh, two weeks ago on a Thursday, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and he um, he was uh, just just had an amazing voice. Um, I learned from reading about you know his life uh, after his passing that he was the very first employee of uh, World Wrestling uh, at the time Federation, now World Wrestling Entertainment. Hmm. Um, so he was employee number one of that company, and, and then uh, he was the he was the first employee that was uh, went into the Hall of Fame, the WWE Hall of Fame. I think so. It? Yeah, yeah, I, I I believe so. So, so yeah. So he, uh, but but he he was known for his trademark voice. I mean, you know, back in the eighties, wrestling still kind of had its mystique going, and not that, you know not that it was treated exactly the same way as boxing or sports was, but there was still some legitimacy around the announcing and 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 just you know trying to carry it as as a sport sort of thing and and finkel just had one of those golden voices uh, oh yeah for, he was for, he was for, michael for buffer before announcing. michael buffer he he was he he really was and and the the best part of his uh, of of his voice and what he did um always happened at, at at the big events whether they were house show events or or the pay-per-views uh w- was when you had um, and, and I, you know, I think he would do this even if it was, was a heel winning the belt, um, because it would just, you know, kind of further, um, emphasize the win, so to speak. But, but when you had a championship on the line, whether it was mm. the world title, the intercontinental title, the tag titles, when, when you had a winner, Howard Finkel just had this, and I'm not even going to try to do it justice because it would just sound ridiculous, you know, for, for, for me to even try. Yeah. Um, but uh, but he just had this way of announcing the you know he would he would say you know the new and he he would just like carry that that new for like a few seconds oh, really yeah. loud really just uh, just just very um, energetic and 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 just with so much emphasis on the new and then you know declare who the champion was and 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 that was just uh, that was what he was and I think just just people came to just really uh, you know he just became part of the fabric of of the company and of the product and and so it, you know so when he when he uh, like I don't know when he actually walked away or retired or, or or what it was but you know at some point he kind of 
um, petered out, you know, in terms of appearances and things like that. And then, um, and it, you know, I think he was on some of the shows they were doing for WWE Network. And you know, he was always tied into the company, but at some point he kind of stepped away from the ring announcing piece of it mm-hmm. um, and stuff. So, so yeah, so it was just uh, you know a little bit for for. You and I, I think it was a bit of an icon from our childhood, teen years, you know, yeah. of, of wrestling and just that iconic voice, you know, just in both in terms of, of announcing the the pre-match, you know, announcements and then obviously the post-match with that with that that new world yeah. champion, you know, sort of thing. Um, so it just just uh, just, you know, just wanted to in some ways, I, I kind of wish I had one popped open right now, but we'll toast afterwards. But just 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 to raise raise a pint. To, to, to the man Howard Finkel, it was uh, he he left an indelible mark I think on a lot of childhoods and, and teen uh, you know teen years from from wrestling and and just was a big part of a lot of people's uh, uh, you know consumption of that product so uh, yeah it so will- here here Howard and uh, you know it's uh, you know it's 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 going to be missed but uh, but we'll post in the show notes one particular really it, it was a really funny uh, kind of reappearance of him. Um, uh, there, there was a wrestler, Alberto Del Rio, back in the early 2010s who had he, – he had his own announcer. Uh, so this guy would come out with him and he would announce Alberto – kind of like what Paul Heyman does for Brock Lesnar. You yeah. Know? Uh, but but it would, they would make a big deal out of it. Like, you know, you know, Alberto Del Rio's announcer would like to announce him. It was something stupid like that. Yeah. And so Punk was fighting Del Rio. At CM Punk was fighting Del Rio. And – uh, it's, I think it was Survivor Series, and it was 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. He had Howard Finkel come out as his ring announcer, so it was kind of like a little, you know, tit for tat sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And and it was really cool. Like Finkel comes out and just the crowd goes nuts for him, and you could yeah. just see the man was just like touched by the reaction. It was it was so cool. He and, damn near teared up, and I oh and, yeah. I, oh, and yeah. I almost teared up watching it. it yeah, it, it was just one of those cool moments that you know they meant for it to him for him just to come out and do the gimmick, and it just turned into this like just for like 30 seconds this kind of moment where he just you know was just clearly touched by by the crowd and and the crowd's reaction to him and Mm -hmm. and it was neat to see at that point at 2011 that people still remembered him you know and and had that affection for him um which really goes to tell you what you know even just as a ring announcer just the kind of impact you know he left on on fans and so he goes to announce punk and so i i think you know you're not quite sure what exactly happened but but there there seemed to be a timing mishap in terms of him trying to figure out when to start with the introduction and so he finally gets the introduction off and punk comes out and and you'll just have to watch the clip but he just like looks at you know he looks at finkel he looks at his wrist like he's looking at the watch and puts his hands up like what the heck you know it's like what what took so long yeah (laughs) but it was it was just such a great it was a great play by punk on that moment he and he gave him a hug and it was all good you know it was just one of those fun fun moments so yeah um, so yeah so little little tip of the glass to to mr finkel yeah pour some out for the fink pour some absolutely ladies and gentlemen absolutely which brings us now to the the first official segment of the show uh sir uh, what you drinking to alcohol the cause of and solution to all of life's problems all right so we we are still can that's right. We have a can. Uh, we are continuing uh, from last week uh, with the consumption of the Brickstone Brewery APA. When you need American protection, Pilo. accept no substitutes. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> that was actually pretty good. I was going to say, I, I just I just did that off the cuff, and I was I shocked myself. <laughs> yeah. Ron's still coming kick your ass, but I mean, it's, uh, well, it's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But yes, I, I will be having a fine American pale ale tonight from the breweries in Bourbonnet, Illinois. Damn. Very nice. And uh, as for me, I'm going. I'm still on the Ixnay. I am on Geary's Ixnay Gluten Removed Pale Ale, made right here in the fine state of Maine. And uh, part of that reasoning being, I was actually going to. I was going to enjoy a celebratory whiskey this evening because mm-hmm. I have been painting the entire freaking weekend away. <laughs> And you know what? After painting and uh, well, uh, painting and mowing the lawn are two times yeah. when really a cold beer is just about the best thing that you can possibly have afterwards. And so I've I'm going with a Geary's Ixnay. I yeah. I would say to celebrate. However, I came up a court freaking short in this project, so it's going to linger on another damn day. <laughs> so between the beer, uh, my my. 
minor irritation over not being able to finish my, my <laughs> project and the fact that I'm over 40 and I was bending down and standing oh up boy. repeatedly over the entire day. So my, my brain chemistry is so far off for this entire episode. Oh, good Lord. Wait, Here we go. Actually, for any of the youngsters out there, any of the youngsters listening, come, on, come, on, come, on, come a little closer to the computer screen. Come a little closer. Come a little closer. Let me let, let let Uncle Todd tell you a few things here. This is something you can look forward to, kids. As you as you get past forty, you don't even need to have a drink. Just stand up off the couch real quick and whoa, whoa. Oh no. Saves you a ton of money. Saves a bunch of money. Now, the yeah. problem is the flip side of that is your body betrays you at the least <laughs> moments and <laughs> you get that quick little buzz from standing up a off the couch, the and then your knee gives out, and <laughs> next thing you know, you're down the damn floor. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, you know what? Hey, it's pluses and minuses, and, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I'm glad you can laugh at my pain. You you insensitive jerk, you. I, I have been there, my friend. You know, you, you, you do a day of painting, and then you wake up the next morning and wonder, uh, where did all these muscles come from that hurt? Yeah. <laughs> See, now you're, this just goes to show, like, I think I abused my body a lot more mm-hmm. in my youth because you're thinking, like, how did I, why do I hurt? I'm like, how am I going to make it to the bathroom to pee? Because I can't, <laughs> I can't straighten oh, up. Oh, gosh. Oh my gosh! That's Bring me funny. the bedpan. Oh, dong! <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Yeah, it's gonna be one of them shows. So buckle I was, up, folks. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> Good oh Lord. boy. Anyways, it's it's nice that we're talking about Westworld because, quite honestly, since this show still has yet to make any real sense to us, the fact oh that we're gosh. not making sense is completely on topic. It is. It very much is. So th- we're talking about episodes five and six, and, and we're only like 18 minutes into this thing. We're finally getting to the subject at hand. Of but course. W- so episodes five and six, this is an, uh, an eight-episode season, correct? Yes, it, yes, it is. Yes. Do you, I mean, do you feel like in sometime in the next two episodes they're going to wrap this up in any way or shape or form? Uh, well, it, it's interesting. In some ways, yes. I, I don't know if they're working toward a cliffhanger of some kind. Um, it's really hard to say. It's yeah. I, I still feel like I, I don't feel like we're 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 doing too much world building at this point because we're, we're we're playing with the same, you know, at least we're playing with the same characters now and. We're, we're starting to dive deep in terms of Sarek's, you know, in, in genre, which is episode five. We start to dive deep into his back backstory, his origin story. You mean um, Sarek, or- right? What did I say? Sarek. So you're you're still back on the on the conversation with Jimmy from last episode where we were talking about Star Trek. You're talking about ah, Spock's dad. <laughs> that's right. Sarek of which Planet honest- Vulcan. <laughs> Quite honestly, it was only a matter of time before one of us did that. It was 50-50 odds. I'm kind of surprised I haven't done it yet. Oh, my gosh. So, so, so say it again. Is it Sirac? Sirac. Sirac, okay. I, I just, so so yeah. now I'm going to be questioning myself the entire rest of the show if I'm saying it the right way. Okay, Sirac, Sirac. Uh, whatever we'll whatever be. Will be. <laughs> Where the hell are we heading with only this Only Rhea Boehm can see... <laughs> All right, oh, you got man. me with that one. I almost, <laughs> I almost so, fell over on that one. <laughs> if but the right on the, one won't get you, the left one will. <laughs> on the plus side, all of a sudden, I've got this dizzy feeling. So I think you're going for it. <laughs> and there goes the knee. <laughs> oh, no, it's going to be the ankle next. It's, it's always the knee, then the ankle. That's the oh, thing. my gosh. That's so it's funny. a one two combo. Anywho. S- so it, it, it is really. I, in, in some ways, this episode is the origin story of Sirac, uh his brother Jean, is it John, John, and Rehoboam, uh, the system that that they build, and mm-hmm. and there, there's a couple arcs we'll we'll talk through in this episode, but but focusing on on this one first, it, this is really, you know, like I said, it's not in some ways, I guess this is world building because it's you know you're, you're getting more of a background of what is motivating Sirach, but you do uh, get an understanding of um, how he and his brother built the system, that there were two other iterations of the system before Rehoboam. 
mm-hmm. um, and that they were working with uh, Rich Boy's uh, father, who I have to take, uh, you know, I'm surprised it took us this long. Figures episode 25 is where we have our first retraction. <laughs> But I, I realized in the last Westworld episode we did, I incorrectly stated that I thought Liam, who was you know rich boy who lost all his money, was the son of the guy who died in episode one in the very beginning. Yeah, I kind of thought that was a little weird. And I, I was wrong. And I was wrong. So his father, um, when we do this flashback with, with Sarak. Sarak. Oh, God. He re- See, I'm s- telling you. You split the difference then. You Instead of Sarak, you were, you were like, I'm just, just going to ride the line. I'm still thinking, K Sarah, Sarah. Anyways, uh, <laughs> um, but but we but we get a sense that we're just getting all kinds of copyright infringement this time. Oh, around. oh well, it's it's, it's gonna get it's gonna get X Nate on, uh, you, on YouTube. You go you go ahead and come for that zero dollars that we're making off this. Go right mm-hmm. ahead, be my guest. I'll Please I'll do. cut you a check for for a tenth of zero. Go Please right do. ahead. That's right. And what we come to find out is, so they they work they're working through the kinks through the first two systems, and then they get to Rehoboam. And what, what was interesting was I, I was reading something the other day about I don't know if you picked this up, but the prior, I think the prior systems they were naming after other biblical kings. Like I don't know if the first one was David, but I, I know that one of them was called Solomon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they got to Rehoboam, and I I got the sense, and I read this that I believe I have to go back and look, but I thought they said that Solomon was looking like a stable system and then they did something with Rehoboam mm. and the article was going on about how with Rehoboam it was almost like a play for power you know like as opposed to you know just finding some sort of balance you know for for the world well if I remember right when they were talking about Solomon it was they were able to map what had happened and so yes. in, yeah they were they yeah. were able to map like what had happened with accuracy or, or see patterns within what had happened and then Ray Boehm is predicting literally predicting and then able to manipulate the future yeah yeah which is more what you know the money guys wanted and ultimately what what Sirach and his uh, well actually what Sirach wanted to be able to right. then to manage humanity in some way shape or form yeah and 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 we get a we get a clear picture of what you know up to this point we have been seeing these these flashes of what looks like essentially an eclipse mm. um and then there would be these little arrows pointing that say like divergence or something like that and, and which i didn't buy as an eclipse at first you were the one who said that in the first episode that we when we talked about this and yeah. i was like ah well it's, it's this and that and the other and now i'm like oh crap you were right and i was wrong <laughs> Well, it, it's totally. I mean, that's it, what he's talking it's about. It's what it. It's what it looked like, and I and I really, I honestly didn't know. I mean, it, it just ended up turning out to be that he uses that, you know, sort of illustration. Yeah. And 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 we see during this episode when, when things go chaotic, you start to see the eclipse mm-hmm. go out of phase, and yeah. and it shows how much. And and I think there's a. I, I believe there is relevance to where the shadows start to form because i believe it it maps to different areas on the world um mm. i think but basically yeah that that Sirach and his brother build this system you know liam's father uh i don't know what his name is liam senior i guess or something like that Nah, who cares he's whatever he he, he, he did now he he didn't end up in a good place but but of course he he's looking to cash in and and he, he's looking to make money off of it so you know Sirach is looking to um, bring balance to the world and prevent the world from going into a chaotic place and destroying itself. And what's interesting is with Rehoboam, it eventually predicts that his brother is one of those high risk individuals that, you know, could, who, you know, if left unchecked, um, would end up destroying the world. Yeah. And so he ends up, which creating... is really interesting when you, when you get into it. I mean, just yeah. the idea of, you know, here's, here's someone who's trying to do this and the person who's working with him to do this is actually one of the wild cards. And, and yes. would would you have even gotten this far if you're not working right. with someone like that? Because really, I mean, even though Sirach is kind of the, the, the puppet master here, it really seems like his brother is really not necessarily the brains, but maybe the innovation, the yeah. just that outlier kind of thoughts that, that are what make them able to be able to do this. Right, right. Which yeah. is interesting because, well, well, would you know, chicken and egg, well, would you get there without him? Right. And and then you can't have him around because then he throws things off. But if he throws things, exactly. I mean, 
we could go back and forth like John Madden this till we're blue in the face, you know. Right. And and what's interesting is we end up learning then that he opens a facility that houses these high risk individuals and I believe tries to rehabil- rehabilitate them to be different from where they were so that they are no longer outliers. I didn't get that. I got it as it was like, you know, Ciroc's home for, you know, home for wayward, you know, wild cards. Like this is a storage area. Oh, really? okay. So, so you didn't get the sense that they're being rehabilitated. It's just that's just where they go and they stay. I get the sense that you, 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 you totally could be right because I, I don't know that that was really communicated. I, I kind of made that assumption when I saw that place. But you're right. I get it, the it could sense be that, just a storage place. that Ciroc is willing to play some lip service to that, and that he might even, on some level, want to believe that he's trying to re- rehabilitate them. But I feel it's a lot like how how a lot of people can look at prison in in real life as oh no it's rehabilitation really it's basically we just want to put away some annoying people yeah yeah and and the rehabilitation is almost an accident it's not i don't i don't well I, i'm not going to get into all of that anyway no but no but but I, but I feel like he might be more along the lines of like i just need to get these people out of the way if i can rehabilitate them great if not then they're still out of the way i think wikipedia concurs with your opinion wikipedia is the best thing ever. Ooh, so, well so, then. so so when I look at the episode summary, um, it talks about how Sirach incarcerates them oh, that's to right. prevent we didn't even read the, uh, we didn't even read the summary. prediction from coming true. So oh, I, I think you're right. I think it is a, a facility to just, I mean, a prison of sorts mm-hmm. to, to house them, to keep them out of society so that they cannot trigger any sort of damage to it. Yeah. So, so yeah, so, so that's kind of a revelation in the episode is that you end up finding his brother ends up being, you know, one of the, one of the imprisoned basically. Yeah. Um, and, and I believe this is the episode too, that starts out with him meeting with a world leader. Oh yeah. It's like, uh, it's, it's some South American country. Yeah. Is it like Brazil. Yeah. Something like that. And, and, you know, you, you just see. You know, we in, in our last episode, I, I brought up the parallels between what Serac is doing and what Thanos was trying to do in in Avengers, you know, Infinity War and and um, and, and the second one in uh, Endgame, and then just how they're they're on this kind of righteous journey of theirs that or, or this righteous mission that they feel they're right about mm-hmm. um, and feel like they are correct in carrying out, but you you can see the control and the power being exercised. You know, and, oh, yeah. and and in that one scene, you see how ruthless he is, how he basically tells him that in a mo in, in, a, in what did he say? In like 30 minutes, your currency will be devalued. You'll have, you know, riots in the streets. I will be, you know, it's almost like he he's he is in his own way doing controlled chaos to keep everything in check. Oh, yeah. And you'll you'll be dead. And then that guy over there with a the mustache is going to be in, in your place. Mm-hmm. That sort of thing. Like, yeah, I mean, and the thing is, it's it's not like this doesn't happen in the real world. It's just right, on. Right. It's on such a sped up scale and 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 essentially centralized to one person who is operating, you know, not as a country or as a, a political entity so much as a singular financial entity with yeah. like this megalomaniac sort of. I'm going to control everything sort of deal, which is a little terrifying, I think. Well, and, and it kind of makes you wonder, too, or I'm just I'm just asking this out loud now. It, it was not communicated in the episode at all. But do you wonder if we will end up finding out that Sirach himself was identified as one of those? Because it seems like he's going about doing disruption, but in a controlled way to bring about a balanced end. Um, but will all of his actions in, in an aggregate at some point lead to essentially, you know, Dolores, you know, succeeding in her mission, which is to basically overthrow this this world from its from the control that, that it's under? Here's the thing. I think that the system is designed in such a way mm-hmm. that Sirach is not labeled. I no? think that that somehow the way the way the system works because I think if he were in the system yes he would totally be labeled that way. Yeah. He would totally be a li- uh, an outlier, wild card, whatever, free radical, whatever you want to call it. Um yeah. it, he would be one of those people that would need to be in one of those little plastic cages. Yeah. The, the little the little Magneto cage essentially is what it looks like. Uh, something between like Magneto's cage and X-Men 
at the end of X Men and uh, and and IKEA really is it's kind of what those look like to me. It's a little miniature IKEA showroom. Wow, uh, he, those are, that's like two ends of the spectrum right there, man. Well, you know that's <laughs> that's Magneto's the prison talking. and IKEA. <laughs> They're kind of the same thing, really. It's the same aesthetic. Anyways, well, anyways. Um, so I think that he would be in one of those little cells. Yeah. If he were part of the system, but I think the way that it, I think that in some way the system is built around him. He mm-hmm. has managed to program himself out, yet he can still control that. I, I don't know how to describe it. I really feel as though he's he's managed to separate himself out of that in such a way that he does not have to face that. He yeah. does not have to face that either. That he is he has tweaked the system to account for what he is going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think you're right. I think he would be one of those people. Yeah. I think he would be one of those people in the little little IKEA cage. But well, and, he's and, the and, one who's running things, so he isn't. Right, and and that's kind of the great irony about what he's doing is that. Oh, totally. It very it very well may be the thing that does bring about, at least his kind's end, in in this world because of this manic pursuit of complete balance. And and is it even mm-hmm. a realistic thing? You know, I mean, it's, you know, this season has been an interesting study because we are living through not that kind of time period exactly, but we are living, you know, being someone who works in the tech world, you know, AI and machine learning is, 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 you know, foundational at this point. And, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of, a lot of tech that's built off of it. And, you know, I think this show is asking some interesting questions about the impact of that technology on all of our lives in terms of, you know, wh- when does predictive technology become too much of a control mechanism or, or, yeah. or, or too much of a prison of sorts? You know, like hmm. just because it predicts one thing, does it mean that that is exactly what, you know, you would end up being, I think, is an interesting question. Yeah. Well, I think the, I think the other part of this is if, again, it goes down to what you what you're looking to the achieve the the ends you're looking to achieve. Yeah. And I think the system can function if you have that one wild card but they're the one that's controlling everything yeah because then everything else can balance around that yeah you can you can have an extremely heavy weight over on one side of the scale but as you balance it against the rest of the world all right but now if all of a sudden you add in another factor a dolores Mm -hmm. now everything is completely screwed up because now you have not only this other factor to account for, you have someone who's almost as uh, who is as unpredictable as you are. Yeah. Now the whole thing is even more screwed up. Yeah. Yeah. And and the and, and now in his wisdom, what he's done is now he's thrown another wild card in there, and now you have complete mayhem. Because I mm. mean, even though he kind of controls Maeve, <laughs> yeah, we all know ain't nobody controlling Maeve. No. That's that's not how she works. Oh no. Um, so you might think you're controlling Maeve. That ain't going to be the way it goes down at the end of the day, though. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. go ask people at the Mesa how that works out. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, wait. There is no one to ask at the Mesa because nope. they all did. No. Nope. E- either that or we find out they're robots anyways. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I, all those are, are fantastic questions. I have no idea if they're going to be answered in the next two episodes. Yeah. I did think that... The one, the one part of this episode that hit me, and, and both of these episodes had these moments at the end that just hit you like a freaking freight train. That moment where Dolores sends out the information to everybody, mm-hmm. and they get Rehoboam's profile on them, and you start reading. And I paused a couple of times just to read what the screen says because it goes so quick. Um, maybe it's just maybe it's just my eyes going as I get older, but uh, my name. Yeah, but pausing that and looking at it, I'm like, oh, like some of those are like gut wrenching. Like I don't know what it was. Like the the guy, the guy, the businessman who had the thing, and and obviously thought he was pretty cool, and then he looks at his profile and how his friends and colleagues describe him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like, and you start, you kind of, you kind of start thinking, like, okay, uh, how does this work for me? And then you start realizing, like, maybe there's stuff that we shouldn't know about each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because it's always that thing, like, well, that might have been what someone said that one time. And then yeah. later they're like, ah, I was just being a jerk, you know? But, right. oh, my gosh, right. as you see everybody reading that, 
and yeah. you see just the like some people react in rage some people are in shock some people are just broken oh my gosh it really does make you wonder like if that actually happened right what would what would go down and yeah. it and it and it kind of lives up to the chaos that it would especially having oh my gosh i forget the the characters names but uh marshawn lynch and and uh giggles and, Giggles. That's oh my gosh! Such a great gimmick with the shirt that like. Tells, I l- like, I the love the shirt. shirt. I love the mood shirt. I I the <laughs> moment I saw him in episode one, I'm like, oh, is that going to change? And sure enough, it did. <laughs> I was like, sweet. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. That is one of my favorite things. But I mean, yeah. you look at the and especially the not not Marshawn, but the the like the the other the other person there who basically like you thought your. You know, you thought you were going to save your, I think it was her, uh, their brother or mm-hmm. something like that, or cousin. And you thought they were, you know, they're going to make you look like, you know, nothing. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to go so far bad. And yeah. Oh my gosh. Just, you see the weight of all that. Like someone who's, oh, that was right. rough. Right. That was rough. I didn't yeah. think, an, I didn't think an end of an episode could get much rougher than that until the next episode. <laughs> Yeah, and no, then it, I was it, like, never mind. It 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 was a big bomb dropping, um, in in that episode, and I I kind of thought they were going to get up to that point and then not drop the information. I really did. Well, and and the I I texted you, you know, later that week about this, thinking, you know, it it almost seems too easy in a way, though. I mean, to to have it be just about, or I mean, just after mid season for since it's eight episodes, mm-hmm. to have. Dolores be able to pull off what she did it it almost felt in some ways too simple you know like like shouldn't this have been harder for her and shouldn't this have you know crescendoed later in the season or not but clearly you know this event is being used to push the narrative forward uh for where for probably bigger and better things in in terms of where they're going for for episode seven and eight well, I think that would have been another series. I think another series, because, I mean, we're thinking in normal terms. And let's face it, Westworld yeah. is not a normal show. No. And I think most series would look at that as like, yes, and this is going to be the cliffhanger for, or this is going to be like the big thing for the end of season three. This will be episode eight, the last five minutes. Yeah. And this is where we're going to leave it. We're going to cliffhang you on like everybody just found out everything. Yeah. Fade to black. And they're like, well, now nah, we're going to do that just over halfway. And, yeah. and now you're going to go, what in the high holy hell are you going to do in the next three episodes? Well, I, I yeah, because because I don't think that in and of itself would have been a satisfying cliffhanger or or would have led to a good, you know, the end I was thinking for for this season. But but it just felt like it was something that would come maybe in episode seven as kind of a penultimate episode sort of event that happens that informs where the f- the season finale goes in episode eight you know well um, i could ins- i could totally instead, see it as a season ending cliffhanger but no i see where you're going too yeah but, well well because i think they're going somewhere else with it that that the, the mm-hmm. point of the season isn't so much about her struggle to get to Rhea Boehm and reveal all this information this this is clearly just an event that is triggering some greater event that's going to happen later on. Yeah. And, and, and we see, you know, and what's interesting is in episode six, which, you know, we can get to that, that, that question in, in, in a, in a few minutes here, but um, you know, it almost seems like that episode is running in parallel with things that are going on in five, because we don't really see a lot of Dolores in episode six at all. And what mm-hmm. we do see is the breakdown in that, in that site, uh, that psychiatric ward, that the man in black is in, you know, and starting to happen because people are getting their profiles from Rhea Boehm um, mm. and, and that sort of thing. And so so anyway, so, so I, I don't want to get ahead of us because we, we're, we're not done with five yet. But but it seems like that event is triggering a lot of the chaos that is that is, you know, propagating throughout the world now. And and it really kind of lends itself to the question of, you know, where is Dolores's endgame going to eventually be at some point? Is it going to be, you know, clearly it wasn't unlocking everyone's secrets is it going to be the annihilation of man is it going to be you know something slightly less than that it's 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 still hard to to tell right now but 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 one thing that that kind of occurred to me just now as we've been talking about this you know with with her releasing the information and pursuing Sirak and and kind of trying to disrupt the balance that he's he's trying to enforce is it's kind of funny when we talk about 
in this show how loops play such a big deal in terms of, of the themes, you know, that, 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 the, that the hosts were, were built into loops and how people are in some ways built into, you know, they have loops built into them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting to see Dolores, is she not continuing to live the loop that she's lived through most of this series? I mean, her whole role is to tear down worlds, is it not? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and the thing is, like, and this actually, okay, so two things. Um, going back to last week's episode when we, we were talking about Star Wars, one of the things that I think that Star Wars fans miss when they talk about uh, the Phantom Menace, or not, not the Phantom Menace, that's just the one I hate. Oh, uh, we know what you think about the Phantom Menace. <laughs> yeah. So The Force Awakens. They had they both had the in the front, and that's the defense I'm going to stick by. So the the Force Awakens. A lot of people are like, oh, it's just a, a redux of a New Hope. I think that there is a a, a genuine uh, a genuine way of of storytelling that is circular, and in showing that, in if you look at the at the trilogy, the original Star Wars trilogy, of course, it's the redemption of Anakin Skywalker, and the the. The beginning of the the prequel trilogy is the downfall of Anakin Skywalker, and then this other this this post trilogy, I guess we'll call it, is uh, is really kind of almost the redemption of Luke Skywalker. After he's, uh, we don't get to see the fall. We don't get yeah. to see that trilogy. We yeah. don't see get to see Luke fall on his ass. But it, it really is kind of the redemption of 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 Luke Skywalker in 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 a way. Mm-hmm. So. The idea, but the idea, you you have to go in in those circles, and yeah. you have to show that it is circular. Like this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and that's why we talk about, you know, like things going through generation about you know, different faults and and things and and, and abuse and and whatever and addiction right. and all that, and it can goes it can go in this circle. Yeah. I think that Westworld yeah. is is doing circular storytelling, but every time you go t- you go through the circle, it just gets wider. Mm-hmm. Now, now we're talking. It was Dolores like wrecking this world. Then it's Dolores breaking out of that world and wrecking the world above that. And yeah. now it's in. It's the. It's the world. Right. Well, we th- we think it's the world. I mean, who knows what the hell could happen at the end of this series? They could go like, nope, sorry. Everyone lives on Mars now, and this is but, a, this is a total simulation. It's the Matrix. Ha <laughs> ha. Here's Keanu. I don't know. I, but, I, I. It wouldn't put it past them. But when you think about it, though, I mean, if we sit here and just ask ourselves the question, what is Dolores' goal at this point? We really can't answer it, can we? Well, here's the thing, and this is the <laughs> second point. I'm going to tie this back, and you're going to love this. You, oh. You're going to love it. I'm, I, I know you're going to love it. Let's hear it. And if you don't love it, then I'm fired. I'm not going to fire you. You can just fire me. Um, so Dolores is Cavill. Oh, ho, ho, ho. she doesn't want she thought originally like I might teach them. I might lead them or this and that. Now uh-huh. she wants to punish them. Mm-hmm. She wants to make them hurt like mm-hmm. she hurt. She is that cavil that that went and got Ellen and made sure that she was there and that she survived the apocalypse so that she could hurt and that so she could suffer. Mm hmm. That's yeah. Dolores now. Dolores is like, you know what? It's not good enough that I win. I want you to suffer. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. where she's at now. That's why the release of all the information is just like another day to her. Like, yeah, it's 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 part of the plan, but it's just another day. Like, that's just the start of it. Yeah. You don't even know how I'm going to hurt you. This is no, just I'm just shaking up the Yahtzee cup right now. Let's just see what what can come out of this. That's a good point. Yeah, that 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 her goal is is to yeah, inflict pain in the way pain was inflicted on the hosts. Oh, totally. Um, and yeah, no, I, I I could totally see that. I it's just funny because it's it's really, you know, to be this far in, we we really don't we we know she's trying to disrupt, but we just don't know to what end. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and and that's the thing I'm coming to a realization now is we're following this path she's on. And I don't know that we ever really understood what her motives were other than she just wanted to get. Like, like you said, there was an element of vengeance against humanity for 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 the way they, they had treated the hosts and her kind mm-hmm. um, looking at their kind as superior. And, you know, I, I forget who said it, but at some point this season someone brought about the idea of them the hosts and the humans living together and someone made the statement that that ain't happening yeah do, do you remember that 
I, I do vaguely. I can't remember. I just can't remember who said it. But it was yeah. an interesting statement to say that there was already the absolute sense that, yeah, a, a host human world is just that is not happening. <laughs> Which I mean, so. and the thing is, it's like it, it, that happens in every sci-fi thing. Like you go back to Independence Day, you know, Bill Pullman, like, can there be a peace between us? It's like, yeah. dude, it's got data strung up there by his neck, and he's talking through his vocal cords. Yeah, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're in a sort of like peacemaking frame of mind. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying. And then in Battlestar Galactica, the same thing. Like we, you know, declared, you know, has anyone thought of surrender? Yeah. Yeah. We offered a full unconditional surrender. They didn't care. Yeah. I think the problem is with, uh, not the problem. This is the brilliant thing that they've done is usually you know what a what the what the protagonist's motivation is. Mm-hmm. And and it's it's it, they're just focused on that. We kind of always think we know what Dolores's motivation is, but then it gets bigger again as we go to a wider circle. Yeah. As we go to the bigger circle, all of a sudden her motivation changes and we're like, "Well, it was this. Now what is it? Because yeah. now we're in we're in a bigger world. We're in a wider world. We're in a bigger story. Now what could she want? Yeah, you know. And it, yeah. it it's it, I think they've done a really good job of managing to kind of almost keep her one step ahead. So you're still wondering. You're like, like you say, like, I don't know what the hell she wants. I'm really not sure. Like, yeah. And I think that's that's a great thing. And it keeps it really keeps you guessing because you can't nail down what what the bad guy really wants. Right. Right. And it might come down to really like a like a very anarchistic sort of thing. Like yeah. some uh, some men just want to watch the world burn. Yeah, I um, mean that's yeah that, that's really you, you know when you're describing it, it very much is reminiscent of the Joker from The Dark Knight. Some men aren't looking for anything logical like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Yes, you know, that, that it, you know, just just being an agent of chaos is enough, you know, mm-hmm. and and so, yeah, I I, I get it because, yeah, the, as you were talking, I was thinking back to the beginning of the season and Rehoboam was the goal. And now that in this episode, Rehoboam has in some ways been conquered, not fully, but in some way, it, you know, the, the, the privacy or, or, you know, what it was doing behind the scenes has now been revealed mm-hmm. um, to to all of all of the population. In, in an effort to disrupt now where do, where do we go from here you know that, that yeah. that's the thing and you know um not, not not to jump right off of this in into another topic but we do need to get to six but i i do want to <laughs> ask you about what what you thought about <laughs> caleb and what he was going through with that genre oh my gosh that was fantastic the, it the, was like the, the storytelling of of the different you know for, from oh. noir to romance to <laughs> oh it was awesome and it was oh, it was so great. Like I, every time, like it was just so perfect. Like the different, the different genre of film that they would go through. Or, or I thought time. about you when that when that was happening because I'm like, oh. I wonder how much he's digging this. <laughs> oh, it was fan freaking tastic, and he played that so well. And then and then Dolores kind of looking at him like, oh crap, it's this. <laughs> You're you are now useless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh, it was fantastic. I thought yeah. that was such a great way to like. It lent a little humor, but it was it, oh man, it was kind of dark humor. <laughs> it was it was such a neat storytelling effect, though. You know, to, oh, to kind of see the world through his eyes as he's experiencing this this. You know, I, w- I don't even know if I call it a high. It was just you know his his. The, his it was like a Mel Brooks acid trip. Yeah, kind of. I, I I mean the the way he was viewing the world and you know hearing the music and you know especially when he was going through the romance phase and he's like looking at Dolores and she- yeah. <laughs> And she's like just mowing down people, and he's like, "She's so lovely," and he and she just killed like another ten people <laughs> without even blinking. Yeah. It's like, oh boy, oh this is gonna end well for you, Caleb. I'm telling you right now. Yeah. Well, and 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 I guess the last part we we should just hit before we go on to six is with Caleb himself is is the revelation by Liam. Like Liam sees something with those glasses, mm-hmm. um, about Caleb, mm. um. That we don't, uh, you know, again, we it's not revealed. Um, although I, I, I happened to jump into something real quick and saw that, um, you know, Seven has already aired. And uh, there there, well, there are certain it's things. It's airing I, I, right now, I believe. I, yeah, I think so. But but I think we don't, will. Under- don't you spoil this. Don't no, no, do no, no, no. I'm don't not spoiling it. anything. But but I will say that it did hint that we, we do understand, I think, what Liam ends up learning in this episode in Seven. 
You mean Caleb because Liam Liam gone. Oh, sorry, sorry. What <laughs> Liam learns about Caleb. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But so yeah. then, <laughs> then, uh, then we get into episode six, which is mm-hmm. called uh, Decoherence. I think. Yes. Decoherence. I don't know, but I thought I thought it was inter- again. I think the the also known as the Man in Black whoop on everyone. <laughs> oh. I thought the I think the episode titles are rather interesting with this, and uh, of course genre can be, of course is the drug that Caleb was on, in episode five. But you also look at Sirach's brother Jean. Yeah, you know it's it's yep. kind of a double meaning there. De- uh, decoherence or decoherence can be viewed as the loss of information from a system into the environment, often modeled as a heat bath, since every system is loosely coupled with the energetic state of its surroundings, which. I feel like the loss of information could be in terms of, of course, everything that just came out yeah. that Dolores leaked to the world. It could also it could also lead to William. It could also lead to the Man in Black, as well, and 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 Charlotte as well. So this one is rife with uh, with losing information. I guess you could say. <laughs> well, and and I also kind of look at this episode as as an offset or a mirror to episode five. I mean, I felt episode mm. five was a very heavy. Dolores getting the upper hand on Ciroc and yeah. I feel like this episode six was Ciroc getting back the upper hand on her yes in some ways and and in more well in in maybe not direct ways in indirect ways but <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and 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 we find some interesting things out along the way so um so we we, we have Maeve back in war world again mm-hmm. running through that opening loop which it's kind of like I, a holding pattern for her of sorts. It, well, it's kind of the reset. It really yeah. is. It's that reset, and then you have to go. And I love in this one where she's just she just takes down all the Nazis, <laughs> and <laughs> just not because she has to, she yeah. wants to. Like she yeah. is, and 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 after she like wipes them all out, and Sizemore shows up, she's like, "Well, that put me in the mood." I was <laughs> like, oh, oh boy, she's pissed. Let's get a drink. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's pretty interesting, and of course you have uh, Hector coming back for a little bit, um, yep. and unfortunately yep. not for long. Um, well, and 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 you know the 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 very first scene is some in some virtual place where Sirac has a conversation with her, and she she you know asks him for allies. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And so this episode is is about him delivering on those allies to her, and and it takes kind of an interesting form. Hector is one of them. Mm-hmm. We don't know who the other two are. And mm-hmm. we still don't. And then one of them, ironically, was going to be Dolores um, because they recovered her orb. Uh, what do they call it? Um, well, do you think that was actually going to be an ally or was that just for her to have access to her? Well, I don't, I don't feel like they would, was they would let up, Dolores out. Well, I, I thought she was hooked up to one of the machines that was creating a host. Was she not? I don't know if that was creating a host or if that was just a host body. I mean, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know if that was just pl- I I don't remember if that was just plugging her into war world or if that was actually if they were making a body for her i don't know yeah i i, I don't know either i i had assumed where because it was weird it looked like a hunk of rock you know what i mean it was like i, I didn't oh, quite yeah. understand it was like from it was from the martin you know host that had been blown up in five um mm-hmm. apparently charred <laughs> so it just looked like this piece of charcoal sitting <laughs> in the fricasseed if you will <laughs> Fricassee Dolores oh. is on the menu tonight. But, uh, you know, I, I guess since we're here, we can jump right into it. But I, I completely enjoyed the, I don't even want to call it a face-off. It was a conversation between Maeve and Dolores. Yes. Oh, man. And and there, there's, you know what's funny with Maeve? There are elements of her character that really get under my skin. I mean, she's a character. It's a show. It's, it's just meant to be entertainment. But... Mm-hmm. When you know when she starts out and she's on kind of her high horse about I, I forget yes. specifically what yeah. it was but she was talking about how that's too much power for one person to have and Dolores flips it right around she's like okay says the person who can control all of us or something with her like, mind yes. with her mind it's like you don't seem to have a problem when you have that power but you seem to have a problem when other people do <laughs> so. which honestly is most of us well yeah I mean and, and that's and that I think that is the great thing about that is it. You're, if you you see that and you're like oh, and then if you think about it for another couple seconds, you're like oh, yeah. wait a minute. <laughs> you yeah. do any self reflection, and all of a sudden this gets a lot more complex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was fantastic. The two of them just 
just talking. And and and, oh. and the content of the conversation was interesting too because you know the Dolor you, you, the Dolores character she was talking to was bringing up some really valid points to her. She's like, "Why are you helping the very person who's trying to destroy us all?" It's like, "What yeah. what is what is wrong with you?" Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 one of those things and and you know as as you were as we were talking about 5 and as I was thinking about, you know, 6 before we got into it here. One thing that's interesting about Maeve, you know, I said this about Dolores being in a loop, you know, tearing worlds down. Do you view Maeve as ever having really truly been in a loop? Doesn't she you know, seem like the one character who doesn't really seem to repeat the same thing over and over again? Like she seems to really be like a wild card. I think, and I could be talking out my butt here right now. Hey, um, that's why we're here, baby. Exactly. <laughs> you know, people ought to be used to that by now. I think, I think Dolores is kind of the, in terms of like anarchy, yeah. if you will. She's the she's the one that plays the part. Mm-hmm. And and kind of wants that and and acts like that. Maeve is the one that lives it. Yeah, Maeve don't give a rip. Maeve yeah. cares about what she cares about, and it'll change depending on how she can achieve her ends. I feel like she's the one who isn't about these grandiose schemes. She wants to be with her daughter, and she wants to make sure her daughter is safe, and she'll do anything to achieve that. And it's one of those deals. Like, uh, I think, oh uh, gosh. But, I but keep on forgetting. Of, go ahead. I keep on. I keep on forgetting who actually said the quote. I think it gets attributed to Bob Dylan. But mm-hmm. in order to be an outlaw, you have to be honest. Yeah. Like in order to live outside the law without any kind of restrictions, you have to be honest. And and to me, Maeve is a very honest character. She's very honest and upfront about what she wants. Yeah. And I think Dolores yeah. is in a way. Yeah. But yet, I don't feel that it's the same between the two. I think Maeve is definitely more of the. Of uh, the anarchistic, of the two uh, of the two of them, if you had to pick, I, I think yeah. Maeve is because Maeve will just always do what's in her self interest to achieve her ends. Yeah, yeah. And and Dolores, I think, has this system that she's built up. And as soon as you build up a system, as soon as you have allies and you have cronies and you have lackeys and all that, well, it's not all that anarchistic, is it anymore? Because you no. now you've got subordinates. Whereas Maeve <laughs> has kind of always been until yeah. uh, up until now when she's asking for help. She's always been very much like, I'm going to do it. Yeah. That's just my thought. But, but, but looking, pa- looking over the past three seasons, though, and, th- you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about this. Maeve, you know, it, it's funny. We, we just talked about how, like, what is Dolores' goal? Like, we don't really have a clear understanding of it, you know, and, and there may not be a goal. You know, it may, it may be very Joker-like where, where it's, it's, it's simply to, you know, watch the world burn. But with Maeve, she has consistently had the same goal. But even though she's had that same goal, which has been to be reunited with her daughter, Mm. she has made decisions that, yes, benefit her own self-interest. But none of those decisions and none of her actions have 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 repeated themselves in some way. You know what I mean? Like now that I'm thinking about she has been really, you know, since this show is trying to also examine, you know, what what is, you know, when you're when you're truly like self-actualized what what does that mean when when you're truly real and thinking for yourself what does that mean Mm -hmm. she really is in some ways the embodiment of that because she is really truly you know living her free will you know and and she's really not bound by anything other than the goal that she's trying to attain which is that that reunion with her daughter but unlike with Dolores like every season with Dolores it has been world busting every season with Maeve so Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, and I was just gonna say with Maeve, is, is there a loop that she's really following? No. However, I, which is so kind of I, interesting. You I know? think if you put it into the context of of uh, of the Joker, then Maeve is Batman. Because not and not because Maeve is a good guy. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, but Maeve is far enough removed at, from the system. Yeah. Because in 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 of course, if you deal with Batman, Batman can do whatever the f he wants. Because well, number one. I'm Batman, uh, but also <laughs> Bruce Wayne got enough money, yeah, that he can just do whatever. He is, right. he, and, and you get enough wealth, and you are separated from a lot of constraints that most people deal with in life. Yeah. So I think that you can look at Maeve as in those terms, but without the "I'm the good guy" sort of thing. It's like, no, I just don't have to follow all the rules because I've got a certain cushion between. I've got a certain buffer between me and and what people are telling me to do. 
So maybe that's a better description. But but do you think with Maeve versus Dolores, do you think Maeve, though, she seems like like when you think about season one and two and, and the way she discovered the real world in a sense, you know, when, mm-hmm. when she was in kind of the, the Mesa getting reprocessed and, you know, reconstituted yeah. and she woke up and realized that, you know, you know, she started to understand that they weren't really real people, that they were hosts and stuff. It, has that always been I, I'm trying to think back. I don't think Dolores came to that same conclusion. I mean, I, I think Dolores knows that they're they're hosts and knows that they're different. But it feels like with Maeve, like she's been more on this journey of really trying to understand who she is. And yeah. and Dolores has been more on a journey of, you know, breaking out of whatever prison she's in. Well, it almost seems like that Wyatt character yeah. had some of that built in, which makes me now wonder who the hell Wyatt, really? You know, yeah. under it all, who is that? But yeah, but but, but, you, but you see what I'm saying? Like Dolores didn't go through a phase yeah. where she roamed the Mesa and came to an understanding like, oh my gosh, this building, like I'm not real. These people are reconstituting me. I, uh, you know, th- that's where Maeve got her superpowers. That's where, you know, she, she came to an understanding of who they really are and, and that sort of thing. I don't remember Do- Dolores going through that same phase, right? Well, no, it's a different trauma. Like Dolores yeah. had the trauma of like, of everything that the man in black inflicted on her like decade after decade and and yeah. as well as you know everything else of being a host i think mave that awakening that trauma came on the other side of that yeah whereas dolores's trauma was in westworld mave's trauma was uh, occurred outside of westworld and then realizing what happened inside westworld yeah yeah so i think it's it's just it's two roots to kind of the same thing but those roots really matter. Yeah. And and it, and that's why I made their conversation so interesting because Oh, totally. And then Maeve, you also realize it's an earlier version of Dolores. It's not the same it's not like a concurrent version of Dolores that's yeah. out there running around now. Wh- which was another interesting point that was raised is that all these different versions, you know, we talked about how she replicated herself, you know, out of a sense of only trusting herself, but now these versions are going to start to diverge. Yeah from one another and so what is that going to lead to or how divergent were they even to start with yeah yeah did she did she just like copy herself at that moment or did she go back and like no i want lesser versions of myself who are going to be much simpler like the little farm girl who you know woke up and told her daddy that she was going to go paint down by the down by the creek right you know right or you know i i think that's it's interesting that that happened yeah oh yeah and and yeah, so so that conversation really kind of brings out, you know, Maeve being kind of single-minded in, in, in what she's trying. I mean, both of them are trying to work toward their own goals, but it just it's interesting to see the difference in in the characters nonetheless, you know, and yeah, um, and just how through that conversation, you know, Dolores walks her through. Well, she's like, well, I'm assuming you're going to have allies, so I'm going to basically mm. try to take them all, and of course, you know, that's what leads to Hector being short lived because uh, essentially mm-hmm. the Dolores version of Charlotte is in the area of Delos pulls where a, pulls a matrix on him. By the way, if you have anything terribly important to say to switch, I suggest you say it now. Oh my oh. gosh. <laughs> un, un, unplugs and crushes, baby. <laughs> oh. Not like this. With, 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 with impunity. <laughs> Oh, Hector, we ain't going to see him no more. (laughs) Uh Uh-uh. He done. He gone. Yeah. Too late. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. So, so, so that was cool. And then, of course, we hadn't heard from the man in black in a while. And then he comes back in a big, bad way in this episode. Oh, my gosh. When he when he was in that when he's in the the therapy session. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you see him in the in a therapy session earlier and he just lays it out. And it's like just people crying. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh! We're all but just maggots. <laughs> yeah, and then like, he comes back. How do you really feel about the world? <laughs> and then they pay that off by coming back to that same sort of setting, except it's all him. And yeah, then, and old man Delos <laughs> is, is the therapist. It's like, oh man, I so enjoy the man who plays Delos. Oh yeah, James Delos. He is just fantastic. I, I mean, oh, just my listen gosh. to him. He's like, oh my gosh, he's fantastic. And even dropped a C bomb on on a uh, on, oh, on in black. I was like, wow. Uh, but oh, but just the way then. he's like, he keeps calling on me. Yeah, my boy. Yeah. 
oh, so fantastic. Oh, my gosh. And then, of course, coming out of all that where you, you basically have Ed Harris, like, I mean, spoilers, uh, he kills all of his prior incarnations, which is interesting because you have, you have him as a little boy. You have him as the, the, the young man that we first saw in Westworld. Yeah. And then you have him as then split kind mm-hmm. of at the same age as the man in black, the, the, the cowboy in Westworld, and then the, the man in a tuxedo, yeah. who is the guy who is, is freed from his uh, darker desires because he exercises them in Westworld. And then, of course, it's him in the, you know, the white jumpsuit right. uh, from the padded room place. The man in white now. Yes. And so he, he ends up killing all of them, and then he's like, I know who I am. I'm the good guy. I'm like, oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> well, and, and I'm, I'm as terrified and pumped up by that as I am of anything in this show. It's like, oh, crap. Ed Harris, the good guy. We're yeah. lost. Oh, yeah. We are screwed, folks. Well, and, and what's interesting about all that is you see the flash. You, you know, there's kind of this flashback to his his childhood or teen years. Oh, which is that horrible. Is. Oh, my and, gosh. Well, and, and you think well, it's going it to go. Well, it goes a different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. You, no, no, no. You think it's going to go this route where, you know, he was abused by his father or something like that. And, you can, and it really comes to find out that he's just a violent guy. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it's really just what it is, is that he, from a, from a very young age, chose violence over reason and, you know, to a point. Um, you know, sc- I mean, I, I, I don't know if it necessarily was scaring his own father, but, you know, his father clearly felt like he just didn't have any any hold on, on him, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of teaching him a better way. And um, and so you come to, you know, which kind of changes our perspective of him a little bit, because you kind of thought his younger self had over time, you know, just grown cynical and, and become the, the older man in black who is more violent and more. Yeah you know, just uh, just knows that this is a fake world and doesn't really think anything of it. Or, or sorry, Westworld is a fake world. But you clearly find out that it's that, that was a playground for him to exercise his violent tendencies, you know? Yeah, and, as it turns out, like, the, 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 the young man version of him was actually, like, the most reserved because he had yeah. buried a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, and, and so we're, we're, we're not left with really an idea of what he means by when he says he's the good guy, because of course he is using the very thing that we're seeing is, is kind of his downfall in a way, violence to, you know, slaughter the other versions of him. Um, but what's interesting is just that, you know, what, what does that mean for him now? Like, like he says he understands what he must do, but we don't know what that really means. Yeah. And so that. That's another thread that you know we're going to work toward too in in episode seven and eight as well. Um, mm-hmm. What one thing I want to ask you is what did you think about the scene with his therapist though? Um, because if there was ever a disturbing scene where you oh. where you only saw the character's legs, <laughs> oh dude. The, so the funny thing is like as he's as he's spilling his guts on what happened with his daughter, I, I that is one of the only times where I'm like oh I know something's going to go. Something's going to take a left-hand turn here. Yeah. And that was when, of course, you know, she gets her download of, of uh, you know, the Rehoboam information. Right. And she didn't, she didn't hear any of that. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. As, he's, as he's going down the hall and you see the therapist walking off her desk and then just, you know, taking a short drop. Yep. Oh, my gosh. That was that was disturbing. But of course, now it's like, how long did he have those freaking glasses on? So did that right. actually happen or not? I mean, but oh, well, that, that's what we're still left disturbing. To, yeah, oh. that, that's that's what we're left to uh, to ponder is whether it really happened or not. But but yeah. it, that was one of those cases, like you said, in episode five, I paused in episode six to see what it really said, because it happened really quick. And I wasn't sure. All I saw was yes. the text from her husband saying, I have oh. the kids don't contact me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what the heck popped up? And I looked, and it's like, you know, she's hooked on opioids. She's been having affairs with her patients. It's like, oh, that's really not good. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. And and so you you can kind of understand. Uh, I mean, I, I hate to word it that way, but you you can kind of understand why he ends up seeing her do what she do what what she does because of of the, you know, basically the complete destruction of of the life she knew in a matter of minutes. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why I think this episode ran parallel with five, because clearly when when everyone starts getting their information and eventually uh, when he's freed out of this all this this AR that he's in where he you know kills the other versions of himself and Bernard and Ashley find him, 
what Bernard said was really interesting, which is, oh, they must have forgotten about him. Yeah. And one of the things I read in Wikipedia is that I think the presumption is because of the download of information from Rhea Boehm to everyone that, you know, in that particular facility, everything went chaotic. And, you know, well, people just Stubbs then say he's like, maybe they just left him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Like, which, like, which kind of reflects how he feels about the guy in yeah, general. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. And maybe they're just like, you know what? Screw him in particular. But but it kind of plays to the chaos that has taken place. You know, oh, that, totally. That, that, totally. That, that everyone has just completely abandoned their post, so to speak, and he was just kind of left in the state. Now, mm-hmm. one thing I found interesting was when they got him teed up for doing this therapy, I found it interesting that that, that mouthpiece that they put into him did you recognize that? Because that that was the same mouthpiece that the guy from episode one that Dolores encountered in the very beginning of the episode put into his mouth before he went to sleep. No, I didn't. Like th- there was this weird thing where he pulled out this oh, this, oh, this oh, mouth the, plate the, that he put in the implant. The implant. What the heck is that? Well, so the do you mean the thing that like drilled into into yeah. like, inside of his mouth? Yeah, that's like the same thing that Caleb had. That was it's supposed to be a like the drip or whatever that uh, like medication and and uh, I, I think that at least that's how I read it. Is it, okay. It's like a it's a medication thing, and that's why the guys uh, who are gonna who are messing with Caleb there and before Dolores took him out and they were able to like regulate his heartbeat and everything is essentially it gives you, it gives them some sort of con- control over your 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 body your body That's, okay okay yeah. so so there's nothing more to that it's just it's just a control mechanism essentially that's what i would think although that could okay. pay off because i mean now you know ed's got one of those roaming around in his noggin so who knows how that'll end up well yeah yeah so then we get into we get into charlotte which oh, oh my gosh so charlotte is is playing kind of both sides here she's trying to get information out and 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 Sirac knows who she is, and and yeah. then of course you know, and this is why I think this is an earlier version of Dolores. I I really do think it's uh mm-hmm. it's a it's a very early version of Dolores because she turns around, she's trying to help her, the the father of her son, and try and help yep. her son. And oh, good God! At the end, you're like, okay, all right, they're gonna get away, they're gonna get away, and then, boom! The, I got to tell you, dude, like it, the I, episode I, that, is bookended though that way, right? The, the the beginning of the episode where she walks with this guy to the board meeting and that guy gets completely offed right in front of her. Oh yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Like, like like just the shock of that, and then yeah. you know, well, but then, that, then you don't think anything is going to happen because right, you're like, right? Well, that happened at the beginning, and then at the end that happens, and it's like, I got to tell you, dude, like uh, that threw me. That mm-hmm. was as surprising to me as Duwala in, in in Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It shocked me that much. Yeah, I, I, like just jaw drop. Oh yeah, you you think that she's pulled it off? You know, yeah. she she makes it back. She gets him in the car. She's getting out of there, and yeah, you you just think, okay, then she must have a plan with Dolores to meet up. And all mm-hmm. of a sudden, yeah, the the truck goes up, and I mean, and it was it was horrifying because they they, they did a lot of, you know, pans to the son to to you know to her ex husband. Mm-hmm. Um, or the father. I don't know if they were ever married, but yeah, um, I don't know either. but but you know they there was interaction there. I mean, it just played out like a normal scene, and just as jarring as the board member getting assassinated in the beginning, just to show how ruthless Sirak is. You then have this 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 bomb go off in the truck and 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 kill um, you know kill basically Charlotte's son and and father uh, or father of her of of her son. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and and what's funny too is you know that actor playing her her partner there um, is a guy who's been in a lot of different shows. Great actor. So in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, okay, he's going to be around for a little bit. Nope. Yeah, <laughs> this is like a very short tour of duty on this show. <laughs> no, he he done, he done. Oh my gosh! But yeah, the um, the 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 back and forth between Sirac and Dolores was interesting this episode, especially the the Charlotte Dolores, where mm-hmm. um, you know he he takes over Delos. One thing I don't quite understand is, given the amount of chaos though that's still going on in the world with everyone getting the download, mm-hmm. he does end up looking at his watch at some point, and it shows the eclipse coming back into alignment or co- or close to it. And yeah. I don't quite follow that because just because he's taken over Delos, I don't understand why that would all of a sudden bring balance to the world. 
Well, because he has he has control over a lot more stuff than he did before. He now has control over. Uh, I'm guessing because you can't get any more hosts out. Y- y- yeah, some type of. Con- I, I don't know. You know what? I'm just making crap up. I have well, no well, freaking clue. No, no. I mean, I mean, you're making I, I it up. No, no. But but the point you're making is fair. It could be that. I'm just saying if that eclipse is meant to or, or that that illustration is meant to reflect the, the balance in the world, we mm-hmm. just saw that the man in black, unless they're playing again with time with us, where we see mm-hmm. Ciroc at a different point in time than where the man in black is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the man in black is when everything, all the chaos is starting. So I'm assuming that Sarek, when he looks at his watch, is experiencing. Ciroc. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that that they're they're existing in the same time, you know, because mm-hmm. I, I don't understand how the chaos can be going on and the eclipse comes back into balance. Yeah, well, I so so it's it's just, but again, that may be something they explain later on. I don't know. I don't know. Well, maybe because the chaos is going to allow them to then, but because anytime there's a, a degree of chaos, there is a power vacuum, and if you can yeah. step into that power vacuum, then you can you can gain some sort of control. That's true. That's true. That's what I'm going to... That's my, you know... That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but but th- th- that was that was such a rough end to an episode, though, to see oh her my gosh. crawl out of that wreck. So, I mean, she's she's still there. You know, she's yeah. still running. I mean, she's fricasseed, but yeah. She's <laughs> <laughs> the word of the day is fricasseed. <laughs> Charlotte's not doing too well right now, but she's she's a. Uh, yeah. You know what? It reminded me, it reminded me of a uh, of the end. So have you seen the John Wick movies? Uh no, I haven't. Oh, uh, never mind. I'm not even going to use that then, because there's it's just it it just just when she crawls out of there, it's like John Wick and John Wick Three, where it's like yeah, you know, how do you feel? Pretty pissed off. That's ex- <laughs> that's exactly the same look that Charlotte has right yep. there. Like, yep. oh, somebody's going down over this. And I have a chance. I have a. I have a good feeling that it's Sirak, Sarek, Sirak, Sarak, or however you've been saying it. Um, it's Sarak, Spock's Sark. father. There you go. <laughs> Spock's father, the guy who did the Ray of Boehm thing. You know him. <laughs> <laughs> it's all uh, logical. It's all logical. Don't worry about it. And another thing. All right, sir. So, what do you got for us this week in ways of a recommendation via another thing? Uh, this is a, a, a small recommendation, if you will. It is not a, a, a book. It is not a show. It is not a, a movie. It is not a grill. Uh, it is nothing I am trying to shill. Look, I rhymed. Um, uh, you. <laughs> You're the uh, Nipsey Russell of podcasts. Uh-huh. Lay it on me. They found an orangutan suffering with a hernia, <laughs> fed him poison from a rattlesnake bite. Gave him the soothing voice of a wild hyena, and he is man of the week tonight. <laughs> what what I, I was inspired last night to, to bring this up, and it actually, uh, given the name of it, is very appropriate given what we just talked about. Um, but uh, last night, uh, Saturday Night Live aired another at-home episode where the cast members uh, did various sketches from uh, their, their home as they are uh, sequestered and quarantined as, as the rest of us are. Sequester. You know what? I like that a lot better than just stay the f at home. <laughs> <laughs> Sequestered sounds so much more dignified, honestly. Yes. But going back many years, uh, Keenan Thompson, who who has has uh, eclipsed, I think, Tim Meadows as longest tenured uh, Saturday Night Live member. That's right. Tim Meadows was on for like ever. Wasn't oh, he? he he was he was, and and Keenan Thompson, uh, he's been on since God, I don't know when. It's been so. Welcome long. to perspectives. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's like a five-minute talk show or something like that. Yeah. It's, like, it's oh, now yeah. 11.56, and we're on perspectives now. Yeah, and, and, and the guy will say something, and, and possibly something you know controversial, and he'll be just like, fantastic. It's 5.58. <laughs> <laughs> it just like completely ignores him. It's just fantastic. So uh, Keenan Thompson is, plays a host on this, I, I, you know, ironically, another talk show um, called What's Up With That? And, and, and that is uh, – that is why I believe is appropriate for what we just talked about because I think mo- both of these episodes, in fact, the three quarters of the season we've seen so far, we're asking ourselves the question: What's up with that? Um, yeah. But that's, uh, the, that's the polite version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the edited version. Yeah, that's, um, that's the safe for work version. 
But it, it is an SNL sketch that Keenan Thompson plays host to. Uh, he he starts out with with a bit of a song. Um, it's all, all I'll say is you have to YouTube it, and, and maybe in the show notes we can include. I, I'll try to shoot our executive producer here a link to one of the funnier ones. Um, if if I, bet I can, they'll have I bet they'll have this this week's up at some point. They'll, they'll have this week's up, but 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 to really get a sense of of the true tone and, and comedy of this sketch, there there were a couple that are just like classics, you know, that are just fantastic. This is like eight to ten minutes of unbridled chaos. <laughs> um, basically, what what he so does it's like is, this podcast is distilled into eight in, to ten in minutes. some ways. You, you know, where you ask you sitting there listening to this and you're saying, "What's up with that? What's up with them?" Um, he has two guests on, um, and so, and those will always interchange. So like, uh, sometimes he's had like, uh, Robert De Niro and like, I don't know if Robin Williams was with him or it was someone else, but he, he's had, you know, different, uh, actors on and, and it's, it's all a goof, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and so he, you know, he does an opening song. Um, he goes to start asking a, a question of the first guest. He, he the first guest sa- answers, and he starts to start singing a song based on something they say, and then it goes into another song. All of a sudden, you have Jason S- Sudeikis come out, who's dressed in like this jogging uniform. Doing, I never knew Jason Sudeikis could dance. Man, the guy can dance, and so he all his role is coming out and dancing. That's it. He just comes out and dances, and he. And Keenan Thompson keeps singing this song, ooh wee, what's up with that? What's up with that? That's all. It always comes back to that song. And just different people come out whenever, it, you know, uh, he, he jumps into that song. And so you never get to hear from the second guest. So Robin Williams literally sits there and says nothing for the entirety of the sketch. It's pretty funny. That's awesome. And then, and then you have um, Bill Hader, who is playing Lindsey Buckingham from uh, oh, Fleetwood Mac, geez. who sits there and says nothing. <laughs> he just mm-hmm. sits there, and 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 every show, you know, Keenan Thompson's character introduces him as you know he he's going to have a segment to the show, and of course they run out of time, so yeah. you never get to Lindsey Buckingham, and he always looks like super ripped, and then he just breaks into a smile usually or something like that. Anyways, it's just. It is just unbridled chaos, but it is so funny. And so they did one of those last night. It was one of the funniest sketches of the night. I mean, it was so, they had Charles Barkley and DJ Khaled on. Um, <laughs> DJ Khaled didn't say a word. Charles Barkley started to say something, and then you know he got cut off because uh, Keenan Thompson, as the host, goes into his song again. But clearly, that sketch was built for a Zoom sort of thing. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. it, was just, it was just you know you you had Fred Armisen coming in on saxophone. You had um, oh gosh, who else was it? Uh, there, there's a couple other throwbacks they brought in. You know, they they just oh, it was hysterical. So if you have a chance to YouTube it, it I mean it's it's again eight to ten minutes of of your of your day, just something stupid to watch and. Uh, just to make you laugh when you're uh, in the in the throes of lockdown and throes of quarantine, uh, what's up with that? Keenan Thompson, just brilliant, uh, just hysterical. So uh, we'll we'll include a link to it in the show notes. Nice. Well, so I'm actually going to use the uh, and another thing that I've been putting off for nigh on weeks, months, months at this point. I think it's like seven uh, weeks we've been booting this thing, kicking the can. But I'm finally going to use it because it is worthwhile. And it's not because I, it's always just I find something that kind of relates to something we talked about during the show or reminds me of something. However, this at this point, I, I want to point this out because this is great. This is great viewing for people who are who have uh, who are home a lot and need a little something joyful. And I think this is uh, this is very joyful. Uh, it is uh, Wolfpack live at Madison Square Garden. I'll include a link to it in the show notes. And the the fantastic thing about this, well, there's multiple fantastic things about this. Let's face it. First of all, this band just kicks ass. They are amazing. Uh, it, pretty much everyone in the band is multi is a multi instrumentalist. So you see people rotating around the stage. Nice. The drummer will then be playing guitar. Will then move over to play keyboards. Will then the bass player does this. And I mean they're all over the frickin' place. Yeah. But the the really cool thing about this is they sold out Madison Square Garden as an independent act. They have no management. They have no specific like big record label or anything behind them. Wow. They sold this out on their own. Which mm. is awesome, and then the the stage they come out on is such like a like a, a like a DIY sort of thing. The entire concert is shot with one camera that is on stage with them. 
Wow. So as the as the as the camera is as they're playing, the camera is moving around stage with them. So you feel like you are literally on stage with them the entire time. And then at one point, the the mother of one of the 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 band members comes out and she is like kind of a meditationist yoga kind of person. Mm hmm. And she leads the crowd in like these like kind of like like I don't know what it is like these relaxation yoga sort of things and they're all doing it and wow. it is so like it is so amazingly wholesome and just heartwarming that like this dude brought out his mom to do this and everybody do the is just like dog <laughs> well the, and she's like okay and now you're gonna do this and then and, and, and feel this flow through you and this and, and everyone's doing it like because they're they're the, again the camera is on stage and looking out at the audience is he wheeling yoda out there and feel everyone's the force flow through you hmm? <laughs> oh it, it's it's awesome it was just so cool awesome. and i'm watching it and i'm like cool. this is just beautiful like that's awesome you brought your mom up to do this and like that's cool and then and then the rest of it is just funky ass music the entire time like yeah. oh my this band they are so freaking talented it's amazing and they have different what, guests come out and all this oh it's what, what genre of music would you put them in uh like funk instrumental just kick-ass musicians that make you angry that you can't play <laughs> that good Oh, is that a genre? Is that a genre? You said it funk. It should be. You said funk. That that, that puts uh, it somewhere in the universe. So okay. we, we can yeah. extrapolate from there. Just just people who make you mad are that good, really. Oh, yeah. But it's fantastic, and everybody nice. should watch it. And it's, nice. it's like an hour and a half of just pure musical bliss. And it's also a lot of fun just to watch them because I'm, I'm a big fan of, of whenever I go to a show of any kind, I'm I'm listening, of course, but I'm mm. also I'm really watching the interaction between the musicians. And there, I've been to shows where I'm like, okay, they are totally just mailing this in. Everybody's up there getting a check. They're doing very well. Then there's other shows where you're like, these people really enjoy making music with each other. Yeah, and they are like, you just see the interaction on stage where they are just so just like getting off on what that other person just did or you know they every everybody's catching all the little musical jokes that are happening and stuff and i really feel like these guys enjoy playing music together just nice. the interaction between them it's like all right they they really like doing this they would be doing this yeah at like some bar for 50 people uh yeah. instead yeah. of you know twenty thousand people at madison square garden if if that's what they were doing um, nice. it's fantastic that's cool yeah, so that's my end. Another thing, dude, you actually got it off, man. You didn't boot it. I, I know. It. Now what? Now what am I going to do next? Uh, week? He, he, he'll have no, he'll have nothing next episode. Forget I it. I got nothing. <laughs> I've got nothing. I'll be like, hey, you know, if you turn your if you turn your calculator upside down and you type in <laughs> these numbers, it spells boobs. That's oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I'll, always maintaining the quality that we. <laughs> <laughs> gonna, gonna go right back to seventh grade. That's what it's gonna be, brother Todd. Uh, br bringing it, baby. Oh that's boy, that's what I'm here. Oh Uncle boy. Todd's here to help you folks and to teach you things, <laughs> things name. that you don't, you don't really need to know or ever should know. <laughs> but I'm here to teach you. Oh man, I'm, I am your life coach that everyone recommends against you visiting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, we thank you all for for tuning in, for downloading, for subscribing, and if you haven't done those for goodness sake would you please subscribe it's going to help put tim's boys through college uh -huh. not not really because we <laughs> make a red cent off of this <laughs> but it sounds better than just eh, it feeds our egos so we thank you for for downloading for tuning in for for listening and if you've made it this far in the podcast good lord go get yourself a drink because you probably need it from listening to us and if you don't need it from listening to us you need it from watching westworld and just trying to figure out what the hell is going on mm-hmm so, as usual, at this point in the show, I, I turn this over, as I like to say, the, the less idiotic of the two idiots who run this show. Quite honestly, if there were three idiots on this show, he would still be the less idiotic. <laughs> he is that far ahead of me. Well, I, thank I you. Turn this, I turn this over to Tim, and I, and I ask him, please, sir, would you take us home? Uh-huh. Uh, just, uh, I, I, I think a, a thank you is in order to our, our listeners, to those who have downloaded the podcast. We are at the quarter century mark in terms of number of episodes. Uh, we are almost at the, uh, the six bill, uh, uh, threshold of, of downloads on Podbean. We, we appreciate the support. We, uh, hope Do you, ever you get have the feeling sometimes when we, when we, when we talk about the number of downloads we've had, you remember in, in Bull Durham, 
where they t- where Robert Wall was like, I don't know how we scored three runs. <laughs> <laughs> how, how we how we won? You ever get that feeling? Like, how did we get to this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, what what's, what started out as just a, a, a kind of a goof amongst friends has turned into uh, the you know, the example of Western civilization in decline. Basically. Yes. Well, you know, we we have to make our contribution in some way. Yeah, well. So, uh, so yes, we, we we're just dragging down the lowest common denominator. <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> You're That's welcome. Right. That's right. Uh, but yes, we we would like to thank uh, all, everyone for their support and uh, and and please uh, s- suggestions uh, send them in to Tim at freerangeadc dot com. Yes, uh, please, th- Pester Tim. What's that? I said yes, please, Pester Tim. Yes, by please. By the way, all I, I, I'm showing my age now, but all I thought of is the Bartles and James guys. <laughs> thank you for your support. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your support, and we'll leave the light on for you. Um, but well, that's uh, Tom Bodet. You got you crossing up your commercials. I, I am, but you know, it's it, you, you can daisy chain them. It works. Well, that um, happens with age. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we we just uh, thank you for the support. Uh, you, you know, it, Westworld. It's. Uh, it, you know, it's it's a funky show, but it's a show <laughs> that that le- <laughs> it's a show that leaves that's putting it mildly that that, that leaves you asking the question, uh, what's up with that? Um, ooh wee ooh wee, what's up with that? So uh, check it out. Um, we're three quarters away through the season. It's 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 been a heck of a ride. I'm I'm very excited to see what seven and eight bring us, and we will be back in a couple episodes to review those and. Uh, mm. pr- probably it'll be a bit of a counseling session of sorts for Todd and I to kind of scrape oh. scrape the, br- the 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 brains that will have fallen onto the floor after we our minds are blown watching episode eight. I'm gonna be hugging a teddy bear. I'm just telling you <laughs> that right now. <laughs> I'm gonna be rocking back and forth holding a teddy bear. Oh man! But hey, make it make it all better, Tim. Make it all better. Uh, yeah, yeah. Week seven though. Week seven of lockdown. We're starting, people. So be safe. Yes. Be healthy, and mm. above all else, please hit the lights on the way out. I think I took the wrong week to quit drinking. I beg your pardon, what did you say? Damn! You're such a disappointing pair. I prayed so hard for you. <laughs> Get out. And don't come back until you reach. So say we all. So say we all. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Click, click. Clicky be click. <laughs> <laughs> should should I stop? Should I stop my local recording real quick before I forget? <laughs>